Amen. What an honor it is to be here today. Thank you, Pastor Clark. Thank you to all of you. We come to religious service in order to have God open our inner eye and open our inner ear so that we are empowered when we go out about our business. This morning I want to talk about, in honor of Women's History Month, I want to talk about one of the great women of the Bible, Easter, excuse me, Esther, and the story of Purim, which the Jews celebrated this last week. Esther was someone who, in the words of many uh, disadvantaged and oppressed people, had made it out. She, in a phrase that Jews often use, she was able to pass. And so she was married to a king who did not know that she was Jewish. He loved her very much. One of his minions had decided to kill all the Jews. So Esther could have just kept her mouth shut. They didn't know that she was Jewish. And her uncle or her cousin Mordecai, we're not sure which, came to her and must have said in some way that we would realize today is a phrase which is basically, Esther, don't forget where you come from. And it's because Esther refused to forget where she came from, that she exercised the power of that remembrance. Just like on the table in front of me, as we often see in Christian churches, the line from the Bible where Jesus says, do these things in remembrance of me. It is when we remember where we came from that we remember who we are. And when we remember where we came from and we remember who we are, that we have power greater than any king, greater than any government, because we are then aligned with the ages. When we remember who, who we are, we remember where we came from, we remember that we do whatever we do in honor of our ancestors and in devotion to our descendants. When we are at a church, when we're at a mosque, when we're at a synagogue, when we're in any place of religious service, I always think of it as kind of like a time-released vitamin C capsule. The power is not just what happens while we're in this room. The power is what happens when we leave this room. And our eyes have been opened and our ears have been opened. And we realize that a story like the story of Esther, the story like the story of the Jews, the story of the Christians, the story of the Muslims, the stories that, that fill any of the great religious and spiritual texts are the stories that live inside all of us. Not only did Esther survive, Esther was even more glorified and her people were saved. I don't believe that Esther was on this earth only to save her people. I think we are on this earth to save ours. I don't believe that Esther was only chosen by God. I think that we are all chosen by God. I believe that when God said to Moses, get down from this mountain and you tell your people, I will make of you a priestly people. He was not only speaking to the Israelites, but to the extent to which we take that story in our hearts, we realize that the Israelites in that story mean the kingdom of all God's children. And if we are black or we are Jewish or we are Muslim or we are American or we are French or we are Chinese, if we are gay or we are straight, whoever we are, I believe in honoring our incarnation. God made us who we are and we are here so that within the space of our people, we might be a priestly people. <clears throat> And so if I am a Jew, I proclaim I am a Jew. If I am black, I proclaim that I am black. If I am Muslim, I proclaim that I am Muslim. And if I am American, I proclaim that I am American. For all of us have multiple identities. I'm running for president, as you know, and one of the things that has been a pillar of my campaign is the idea that America should pay reparations for slavery. But when people have said to me, oh, this is your agenda for black people, I've said I don't have an agenda for black people, it is my agenda for America. Because it is only when we stand in justice, as Martin Luther King said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Amen. I believe that at this time in our history, America itself is imperiled by our shallow thinking. America is in peril by the fact that we have been so distracted by things that are outside us. We have been so distracted by the things of this world that we have forgotten where we come from. And we all come from the same place. And we are all empowered by God, I believe, in the same way. 
So Esther knew that she was here to be a vessel of the salvation of her people. But in being a vessel of salvation of her people, it wasn't only, okay, God is going to destroy your enemies. It was not only that God is going to give you a reprieve. It is also that God expects something of you. A lot of times people forget that about the story of Moses and the Israelites being rescued through Moses from slavery in Egypt. It wasn't the point of the story is not just that God saved them, but that God expected something of them. And I believe that that's what all of us need to remember right now. Being American does not just give us rights, it gives us also responsibilities. We need to go deep, I believe, and to remember we are part of a great historical narrative. If we are black, if we are white, if we are Jew, if we are Christian, if we are Muslim, we come from some much deeper place than just our identity in the mortal world. And most importantly, we come from God. There is no amount of money that can save this country. There is no amount of military power that can save this country. There is no amount of technology that can save this country. All those things can do is just fix things. That which fixes things does not necessarily transform things. This country must have a great rising up from a place in us which goes beyond the reasoning mind, which goes beyond the mortal mind entirely. And that is what has always saved this country. There was no reason for the abolitionists to think that they had any chance at all to end slavery. There was no reason for the women suffragettes to think that they would have the power to gain women the right to vote. And there was no reason to believe that the forces of the civil rights movement could override the forces of white supremacy and segregation in the American South. It is not reason alone it is not reason alone that causes the great waters of justice to rise up and to cleanse our souls and then to purify our nation. This is a time when it's extremely important, and we all know this, to identify the problems in this country. We must remember our ancestors and we must be devoted to our children. Here on Women's History Month, it's very important that women not make this a self-congratulatory moment. For we are not only descended from women who have done great things, we are the women who will be looked at by women 50 and 100 years from now as the ones who made our history, and they will ask, what did you do? Let them say more than, ooh, we did it, we got power. Let them say, we did it well. Because the point is not to just get more power as women, as blacks, as men, as Americans. The issue is not just to get more power. The issue is, what are you doing with the power that you got. <clears throat> and when we have millions of American children who go to school every single day, ladies and gentlemen, every single day, the women, the there are children in this country, millions of them, who go to schools that do not even meet minimum safety standards in those buildings. Millions of American children every single day go to schools that do not have adequate school supplies with which a teacher can teach a child to read. Those children, if they have not learned to read by the age of eight, have a drastically diminished chance of high school graduation. If those children cannot read by the age of eight, they have a drastically increased chance of incarceration. Millions of these American children live in what are called America's domestic war zones, where the violence that they experience in their homes, in their streets, in their families, in, the, in their schools, in their communities is so great that Neurologists and psychologists tell us that the PTSD of a returning veteran is no greater than the PTSD of these children. Also, let's remember the P for a veteran is post-trauma. The P for these children is present trauma, for that trauma is triggered and re-triggered every day. And those children, I have learned this, I have traveled this country, they are in every state in America, including South Carolina including a state that has a billion dollar surplus and will not use that money to reach out to these children. This is a moral, spiritual dysfunction in this country and this country will not be redeemed, this country will not be transformed, this country will not be saved until we speak up from the depths of our hearts and say, this must stop. Amen. <clears throat> <clears throat> and it is women 
It is women who, if we rose up, it is women who, if we remembered where we came from, if we remembered that we are the daughters and the granddaughters and the great-granddaughters of women who have stood up in their time and done great things, if we remember Esther, if we remember all of the people of history, what has happened to American women these days that we have become so precious? I hear women all the time say that they're traumatized. Everybody's so traumatized now. They're so traumatized by the Trump presidency. We're all so precious. You think those people who walked across the bridge at Selma were not traumatized? They didn't know if they were going to take out the, the dogs. They didn't know if they were going to take out the hoses. They didn't know if they were going to take out the bullets, and yet they walked. You think those women, those women suffragettes who were in prison, who had been thrown in prison because they were marching for the woman's right to vote, who because of the terrible conditions in prison went on hunger strike, and so the response of the prison was to put those horrible metal contractions around their neck and force feed them. You think they weren't anxious? You think they weren't traumatized? You think they weren't depressed? Sometimes. I'll tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, this business about, oh, you're depressed, you're upset, there's something wrong with you, take a pill. Let me tell you, sometimes the fact that you're upset is a sign of mental health. Sometimes you're upset because you know something's wrong here. I'll tell you, that's why American women are upset. We know something's wrong. And not only do we know something's wrong, we know it could be made right. But it will not be made right just by a superficial fix here or a superficial fix there. We will not be lured into any power structure, political or otherwise, which says, if you will only help us to fix it over here or fix it over there, we will work towards a solution. No, 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 no. It is too late in America to work towards a solution, whether it has to do with those children, whether it has to do with race, whether it has to do with the fact that we do more to prepare for war than to wage peace. Don't tell me we're going to work towards a solution. Solve it and solve it now. And that, I believe, is what women should stand for. I'm a mother. How many of us have children? And when you have a child, something happens to you. We've all been there. Usually it's in those teenage years. Usually it has something to do with drugs or sex or whatever it is. And this fierce thing rises up in you, and you make it very clear about whatever it is, that will not be happening in this house. Now, usually at that time, we're actually laughing inside because at that point, if they challenged us, we don't really know what we would do. But we're so fierce and that look on our face is so fierce that they're like, oh, whoa, oh, whoa, ain't going to happen because mama said so. Well, you know what? We need to become that way about our country. We need to become that way about our world. Some things will stop happening now. Do not tell me that in the richest country in the world that millions of American children have to live in chronic trauma. Don't tell me that in the richest country of the world we cannot rescue these millions of American children just like we would rescue them from a natural disaster. Do not tell me that in the richest country in the world it is not immoral for us to ignore and to collectively neglect these children who have no clout, who cannot compete with the major economic forces of major multinational corporate forces whose money floods the halls of Congress. It is not just that that is undemocratic. It is not just that it is un-American. It is immoral. And when we remember that, when we remember that it is a moral and a spiritual dysfunction in this nation that is rotting us from the inside, that leads to our political corruption, that then leads to our, polit our human devastation on so many levels, that something rises up from deep inside us. As much Mothers and as fathers and as citizens of this country, when we rise up and are clear, this must stop now, then we will no longer serve a political system that is not dealing with the issue. That political system will be forced to see that they are here to serve us. And in Women's History Month, in Women's History Month, let us all remember, you know, a common anthropological characteristic of every advanced mammalian species that survives and thrives is the fierce behavior of the adult female of that species when she senses a threat to her cubs. A mama bear, tiger, lion, throughout all of the animal kingdom, you come for that mama's baby, she's coming for you. And in any species, in any species in which the adult female does not stand up to make sure that the children are protected and the children are saved, that is a species that is not proactively expressing its intent to survive.
And so, ladies and gentlemen, at this point in our history, let us not be distracted. Let us remember who we are and where we came from. Let us remember that we are here about our Father's business. Let us remember to do these things in remembrance of him. And just like Esther, when we remember where we come from, when we remember that God is leading us in our assignment, then we will have the power thereby. We are like the, the, the children of an infinitely infinitely wealthy father but because we have forgotten that we are not claiming our inheritance when you remember who your father is you remember that he has shared his riches with you then you leave from this place on whatever your assignment is whatever your incarnation is whatever your city is knowing that among other things we are all Americans and we are here empowered not just to receive the blessings of this country but to heal this country when it needs to be healed to correct this country when it needs to be corrected let us not only identify the problems in this country, but to identify the problem solvers in our history. We are a country that answered slavery with abolition. We are a country that answered the oppression of women with the women's suffragette movement. We are a country that answered segregation and institutionalized white supremacy with the civil rights movement. Well, some of those forces have come back around again. Some of those forces of bigotry and anti-Semitism and xenophobia and homophobia, they're back. No Jew or no black person thinks this stuff is new. It comes back. It comes back. It's an ongoing process by which generations have to rise up and say from deep within us, you did it to our grandparents and you're not going to do it to our kids. <clears throat> and when we do, we are empowered. We are empowered because we know that it is our moral responsibility to stand up. We know that when we remember that we are coming from a place of knowing that God has sent us on this task to honor our ancestors and to live in devotion to our grandchildren, when we remember that we are of a people and we must stand for a people, and at this time in our history, we must stand for America itself as well as for the individual identities, then something fierce rises up in us, just like it rises up in every parent who makes it clear that that dangerous thing will not be happening in this house. And when our kids even question, even dare to question what we said, something fierce rises up in us if we're women and we make it really clear because mama said so. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, I envision a world in which the horrible things that could be happening, including the fact that all these tens of thousands of people have starved in Yemen, including those children, Oh, won't it be a beautiful day when people all over the world will know that certain things they don't have to worry about happening because American women will not let it happen. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm so proud and so honored to be here today. I thank you, Pastor Clark, for the spiritual courage that I have received and the spiritual sustenance that I have received. I will be going out about my day, my week, my month, as will all of us here, having been fed, having been imbued with the remembrance of who we are and where we come from. I hope that among other things you will consider, you will be hearing as people, this is God's house. I, I, we honor every aspect of our lives individually and nationally, and that includes things like political campaigns, Political campaign is a great family meeting. I'm not running against anyone. I'm running with a lot of wonderful people, all of whom you will be meeting and listening to as you should. But I hope that you will just consider. Not, not that it is any better or any worse than anything that anyone else will be saying to you on the campaign trail this year. But my belief, we need a mother in the White House. You can take that however you want. Thank you very, very, very much.